Morant with a running start. Elevate. Oh, oh, it does. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh. He's done. High game in overtime. Gasol will turn. into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took except Adams going long. Moran! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Moran gets 70! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Grizzlies win! One of their last two games edition. My name is Keith Parrish. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about the blowout victory over the Orlando Magic. The Grizzlies go wire to wire to win their home opener. I'm also going to talk about the road loss on Friday night to the Houston Rockets. Right now, the Grizzlies are 2-1 and one after their first three games, and frankly, that's good. That's what we were hoping for. Winning two out of three to start the season, now they have three more home games coming up where they can get off to a very great start. But on today's episode, we're going to talk about the win against the Magic and the loss to the Rockets before I get there. Just a reminder, if you want to sign up for Underdog Fantasy, if you want to play hires or lowers with the start of the NBA season, if you want to do nightly fantasy drafts against your buddies, Underdog offers all of that. And if you sign up using my promo code FBBF, Underdog will match your opening deposit up to $1,000. They will also give you a free higher or lower pick. So if you want to give that a try, use my promo code FBBF or click the link in this episode's description. All right, a lot of good storylines from the weekend. Yes, the loss to the Rockets was pretty ugly, but the win over the Magic may be as pretty as the Rockets' loss was ugly. Now, there was still... A third quarter issue. The Magic had a 21 to 0 run in the third quarter. It's not often you win comfortably in a game where your opponent had a 21 to 0 run. But the game against the Magic, of course, was the debut of Jaron Jackson Jr. This season, Jaron looked good. I mean, the Grizzlies outscored the Magic 65 to 39 when Jaron Jackson Jr. was on the court. That's in just 22 and a half minutes of Jerry Jackson Jr. playing time. The Grizzlies won those 22 and a half minutes by 26 points. But beyond Jaron, John Morant played well. He picked up his 60th career points, assists, double-double. Grizzlies PR lets us know that he is now tied with Mike Conley for the most points, assists, double-doubles in franchise history. Off the bench, Scotty Pippen Jr. also had a points, assists, Double-double, Scotty Pippen Jr. had a career-high 12 assists. The team posted 38 assists, which is amazing. By the way, Ja and Scotty became the sixth pair of Grizzlies teammates to each have a points assist double-double in the same game. Honestly, it would have taken me a lot of guesses to get these. The obvious one... To me, Mike Conley, Mark Gasol. Yes, they did it once. All of these people did it once. The other combinations, I would have gotten there, I think. Maybe. Actually, I'm not totally sure. The other combinations, going back to the Vancouver days, you got Mike, Bibby, Michael Dickerson. The early Memphis days, Chucky Atkins, Pal Gasol. Then you had Mario Chalmers, Mark Gasol. And then Ja and Jonas Valanciunas did it. That was the most recent pair of Grizzlies teammates. They each have a points and assists double-double in the same game. Scotty Pippen Jr. and Ja Morant do it in this game. Also in this game, in the win over the Magic, you had Santi Aldama with 22 points, 7 rebounds, and 5 assists. And then meanwhile, Jay Huff, what's gotten into this guy? Jay Huff had a career high 18 points. The big storylines for the Grizzlies two and one start. I mean, it's not that like 
Desmond Bain's been good. He's been good. It's not that Marcus Smart's been stepping up. Not so much. I mean, of course, it's the John Morant is a very good player. But the X factors that maybe we did not expect, Scottie Pippen Jr. and Jay Huff have been tremendous. And they are a big reason that the Grizzlies have won two of their first three games. Right now, Jay Huff, he's 8 out of 14 on three-pointers for this season. He's averaging 13 points per game in his bench role. He's leading the team in blocks per game. He has five blocks this season. He's leading the team in field goal percentage. If we throw out John Conchar's three for four from the field, John Conchar right now with some sweet 75-75-75 shooting splits. By the way, John Conchar missed the game against the Magic. And then Scottie Pippen Jr. On the season, he's made over 50% of his field goal attempts. He's three out of six from the three-point line. But Scottie Pippen Jr. this year averaging 10 points per game, averaging eight assists per game, averaging 1.7 steals per game. Yeah, he's still turning the basketball over, but I can ignore these Scotty Pippen Jr. turnovers if he's going to play like this. Scotty and Jay Huff absolutely have been the X factors on this season. Now, I guess let's pull back a little bit big picture from this game. Let's focus first on the Magic game, then I'll get into some of the issues with the Rockets game. The Grizzlies win at home, which should be taken for granted, but remember last season... They posted their worst home record in the Memphis era. They particularly struggled on the weekends, which is just odd. So it was good to see them get off on the right foot. It was good to see the whole squad back together. I mean, it's not the whole squad. I'm still waiting for the Vince Williams Jr. return before I finish my like Thanos Infinity glove type situation. But the Grizzlies are getting closer. They started Ja Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart, Jaron Jackson Jr., and Zach Eady. This was the presumed starting lineup after they drafted Zach Eady. This was just the sixth time that Ja Morant, Marcus Smart, Desmond Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. started a game together. Last year, they were 3-2 and two in those instances. Last year, Bismack Biombo was the center. This year... It was the top 10 pick, Zach Eady, as the center. We also saw some lineups that we'd never seen before that we'd always wanted to see, or at least lineups that we hoped to see after the Marcus Smart trade. Specifically, we saw Ja, Desmond, Marcus, Jaron, and Brandon Clark all playing at the same time. I have a lot of nostalgia for the Jaron and Brandon Clark lineups. Brandon Clark has been a step slow this season. And he clearly doesn't have the full confidence of the coaching staff yet. And he hasn't maybe regained his full confidence. And he does not look as spry or as athletic as he used to. But I still enjoyed seeing him out there. Now, in the game against the Rockets, Brandon was the 11th guy in the depth chart. He was the final sub to check in. He is last on the team in minutes not counting Yuki Kawamura. In the game against the Magic, he was the first sub to check in. A lot of that had to do with the fact that it was Zach Eady getting in foul trouble. So you had Brandon Clark come in as the backup center. They did not like turn to Jay Huff that early or go with the Santi Jaren lineup. So a lot of this for the win over the Magic, we think about just the team is becoming whole. Now, a big picture question is going to be what happens later this week when Luke Kennard comes back. Have you been missing Luke Kennard? I haven't really been missing Luke Kennard. I'm enjoying the Jalen Wells bench minutes. I am enjoying, surprisingly, the Scottie Pippen Jr. bench minutes. I mean, Scottie Pippen Jr. has been a revelation. He has exceeded my expectations by a good bit. I like Scottie Pippen Jr. I said he was worthy of a main roster spot. I thought he would be good, but he's been better than anticipated. I got a little bit nervous when he led the team in minutes in the first half against the Rockets. I mean, let's be honest. That probably should not have happened. One of the big storylines for the Rockets game, besides getting pulverized on the glass, was the fact that John Morant played 11 minutes in the first half. After the game, Taylor Jiggins said that John Morant asked to leave the game at that point. Maybe John's tired. They're bringing the team along 
slowly when it comes to minutes. That's a that's a big overarching storyline for the first three games. Right now, no one's playing that many minutes. Desmond Bain leads the team right now at 28 minutes per game. Santi Aldama is second on the team in minutes per game. Right now, Jaws averaging just about 25 minutes a game. They are being very particular in keeping a close focus on their minutes load, it seems like, and they're very cognizant of their schedule with six games in the first nine days of the season. Now, that's something I highlighted when the schedule came out, and I think it's good they're monitoring it. I also personally always wonder, like, what's the difference between 28 minutes and 30 minutes? What are we talking about here? How much rest is a guy getting or how much wear and tear are they saving? Perhaps there are studies like three minutes of an NBA game equals half a mile of running or a mile of running. I don't know. But I'm always like, all right, so you played the guy 25 minutes and not 28 minutes. Is that going to keep him healthy? Is that going to keep the 25-year-old healthy? I guess so. But they have definitely spread out the playing time. They've stuck with their 11-man rotation through these first three games. But I guess the big takeaway, as much as we want to nitpick about certain aspects of the rotation, the big picture is they're two and one. That was the goal. That was my goal. Get a split on the road, win your home opener. Now, the Jazz game, was it needlessly close? I think you could make an argument that perhaps it was. The Rockets game, I think you you lost that one anyways. You were going to lose in that second half. It slipped away. Now, there are fair criticisms or question marks to ask about the lineups that were on the court when the Rockets made their big run, where the Rockets, I think, had a 24-2 to stretch against the Grizzlies in that third quarter. And during a lot of that time, Scottie Pippen Jr., Jay Huff, Jake Laravia were all on the court together. But those same guys have been doing it in the other games. Jay Huff in the win over the Jazz and in the win over the Magic, he made every big shot. It seemed like he stopped to every run those teams went on. So while I have questions about the lineup sometimes, they've come through in the other games. I mean, before the season, if you ask me, hey, should Scottie Pippen, Jay Huff, Jalen Wells, and Jake LaRavia all be on the court at the same time? I would have said absolutely no. What are you doing? No. And that lineup got toasted against the Rockets in the third quarter. But then it was fine against the Jazz. It was fine against the Magic. And then also you're making an investment. And this is something Taylor Jenkins has always done. He's made an investment in the entire roster. And you think you're going to reap the benefits of those investments later in the season when Jalen Wells actually has some experience when Jake LaRavia and Scotty Pippen Jr. have been in some high leverage situations, you should get those benefits later in the season. And again, it all worked out. You won the close game against the Jazz. You took care of business against the Magic. And you took care of business in a big way. You led wire to wire. The Grizzlies ended the first half on a run. So they led 69 to 43 at the break in that first half, you got just unbelievable performances from the bench. Aldama, Pippen, and Huff combined for 28 points in the first half. They were 12 out of 15 from the field. Meanwhile, Jaron Jackson Jr. didn't miss a step. He was scoring on those floaters off the dribble. Jaron did a good job all game. I felt like at not committing offensive fouls, he was attacking the basket and scoring that way. He only finishes the game with 13 points, but 13 points, four rebounds, and that one assist is an awesome assist to Jay Huff where he drives towards the basket. Does a good job of finding the cutter as Huff comes in from the baseline and finishes with the reverse dunk. Jaron also got a steal, and again, he led the team with a plus 26, plus minus. He would have played more minutes. I'm not bothered at all by the 22 and a half minutes or the low minutes for a bunch of the starters in this game against the Magic. If the game were close, pretty sure he would have finished like 27, 28 minutes around there. John Morant with that double-double, 16 points and 10 assists. 
I mean, I guess we can be a little bit displeased or slightly worried about Jaws shooting so far. He is not making jumpers and not particularly effective outside the paint. I mean, that was one of the things that that bothered the Grizzlies against the Rockets just as a team. They only had three shots that they made in the second half outside of the paint against the Rockets as a team. They only made 10 out of 28 three-pointers against the Rockets. They also missed a ton of free throws against the Rockets. So just a lot that didn't work out for them against Houston. Now, Santi Aldama's game, that line off the bench is preposterous. Having 22 points, five assists, and seven rebounds off the bench, making four out of six three-pointers. Santi has now led the team in scoring in two games, and then in the game against the Rockets, he had two points. Thus, this is up and down Santi, but Santi was tremendous in the game. I think the win over the Magic was Marcus Smart's best game of the year. He had nine points. He had a really good block. He got two steals, some nice assists. Marcus overall this season, if we want to look big picture, still not ideal. I think there are some questions about his fitness right now. I think... I hate to mention it, but there's some questions just about his overall level of play. I mean, it's a little bit glaring that he does not look to be a better basketball player than, say, oh, I don't know, Dylan Brooks? Or is he as good as Tyus Jones? That part's been bad, but so far it's not been catastrophic this season. Uh, He did leave the game against the Rockets with injury for a little bit. Uh, I was nervous, I think like most Grizzlies fans, but he did return to the game, and he ended up being fine seemingly for the matchup against the Magic. By the way, going into the game against the Magic, both Jaron and Ja were questionable, and it wasn't right up until game time where they made those decisions. Now, we always expected Jaron to play because they told us he'd be ready for the start of the season, and then when he wasn't ready for the start of the season, they were like, yeah, probably the home opener is when you will see him and then he was doubtful for Friday night so we assumed that meant questionable for Saturday night and he was in but John Morant acted like maybe he wasn't even going to play and he said post game that Grizz Twitter forced him to play he wasn't going to play until he saw Grizz Twitter talking about it so I guess good job anyone who did that I don't feel like I contributed at all in that situation but now I guess we have to question Will Ja, Marcus, and Jaron all be available for the next three games? By the way, the setup, the schedule setup right now, you get the, the two-in-one start. That It's what I was hoping for. But now you're set up to have basically a dream start to the season if you take care of business. The Grizzlies play the Bulls on Monday and the Nets on Wednesday. You're going to be favored in both those games. If you can take care of business... You get off to a 4-1 and one start. Then you play another home game against the Bucks. I mean, basically, win two out of three. That's what I'm asking for. You win two out of three in these home games against the Bulls, the Bucks, and the Nets. You're feeling, I'm at least feeling very, very good about a 5-2 and two start to the season. I mean, essentially, the formula is win three-fourths of your home games and win half your road games, and that means you won 50 games. So the Grizzlies can do that. Now, if you drop a game against the Bulls and Nets, you're going to be disappointed because you're going to be big favorites. I mean, the Bulls, they looked frisky. They upset the Bucks, But, like, the Nets looked terrible. So we will be distraught if we lose to either, I think. But then you just, if you lose to either, then just take care of business on Thursday against the Bucks. Win two out of the next three home games. You get that five and two start, and you are sitting in a very nice position in the Western Conference. Um, Going back to Scottie Pippen Jr.'s play. Scottie Pippen Jr. maybe is the best on the team right now at understanding the assignment for the back cuts. He got three back cut layups against the Magic, and I thought it was amusing that all three were against three different Magic guards known for defense. He got Jalen Suggs, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, and Anthony Black 
all on back cuts. That is how he scored. Uh, that's three out of his five baskets. And then he made his one three-point attempt. So that's how he finished with 11 points. And again, 12 assists, got two steals in this game. Just Scotty Pippen Jr. has been very, very good creating those mismatches, creating the advantages off the dribble, and then knowing to cut towards the basket and help out his teammates when they get stuck with the basketball. Now, Zach Eady. We haven't talked a lot about Zach Eady. Zach Eady barely played against the Magic. I mean, he only played 13 minutes. He did make a three-pointer. We're all very excited about that, but he once again got in foul trouble. And if you want to take one wider view of his first three games, foul trouble is a problem. He is prone to fouls. He needs to stay on his feet. He's jumping on pump fakes. Also, he's falling for most every post move that offensive players do. Also, dribblers are going into his body, and he is not yet able to figure out how to navigate that situation without committing a foul. So, Edie, where he had good stats against the Rockets, had 13 points and 9 rebounds. Edie has done a good job of just hanging out near the basket and catching passes when... His man leaves him. He's catching passes for dunks. But beyond that, he's fouling too much. His rebounding is not really as good as you would hope. Right now, the startling stat, the bad stat, in the 104 possessions, non-garbage time, that Zach Eady has played, the Grizzlies are only rebounding 58% of their opponent's misses. That is impossibly bad. Cleaning the glass rates that as the zero percentile. Only getting 58% of missed shots on the defensive end is terrible. And it's not Zach Eady's fault because the other guys he's playing with, usually not very good rebounders. John Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart, they get rebounds, but they don't normally get contested rebounds. Santi Aldama, not an ideal rebounder. Jaron Jackson Jr., not an ideal rebounder. So we've asked, we've begged Zach Eady to please get rebounds. But right now, the Grizzlies have some horrible team rebounding numbers when Zach Eady is on the court. By the way, the, the rebounding deluge that the Grizzlies endured against the Rockets, they lose that game because of the rebounding. I mean, yes, the shooting was bad, but they got out-rebounded by over 20 rebounds. The Rockets got 64 rebounds. They also got 27 second-chance points. The 64 rebounds, that is the most rebounds a Grizzlies opponent has had since Game 6 of the 2022 Western Conference semifinals when the Warriors had 70. When Kavon Looney had 11 offensive rebounds all by himself. That is the most rebounds a Grizzlies opponent has had in the regular season since 2015. So the story of the Rockets game, maybe you could say it's weird playing time, fair, but it was getting destroyed on the glass. And Taylor Jenkins saying the team got punked. I mean, remember, Taylor Jenkins thinks rebounding is a want-to situation. It's a willpower situation. I mean, maybe it is somewhat. Of course, it's not one thing or the other. Effort and execution plays a huge role. My thing I always pick at is I believe it's a skill, mainly. And if you play guys who aren't good at rebounding, you're normally going to get beaten on the glass but they lost the rebounding badly against the Rockets and some of that is the fact that Zach Eady right now isn't making the impact as needed also everybody else on the team pretty bad at rebounding but so far this year uh Eady is only averaging 17 minutes played per game and a lot of that is foul trouble he's averaging 4.7 fouls per game of course he fouled out in the first game in 15 minutes he's averaging eight points five rebounds and he has one block on the season and now let's take a break and i still got a lot more notes 
to get through and some player performances to discuss. We'll do that right after this quick break. All right, I've been bouncing all around. I'm just going to run through the rest of my notes and hit the bullet points I have written down. The Grizzlies lost that third quarter in Houston by 21. So some fun with stats right now. They have a negative 47 net rating in third quarters for the season. The first half against the Rockets, frankly, It was super fun, despite the weird minutes allotment, despite the fact that Desmond Bain got in foul trouble and basically didn't play the entire first quarter. The first quarter was 38-38, to so a very high-scoring quarter, and the Grizzlies scored 38 points in that first quarter without having a fast break point. That was interesting. John Morant came out looking like he was going to go for 40 points. He ended up scoring 15 points in the first half. That's in just 11 and a half minutes of playing time. Desmond Bain, after missing most of the first quarter with his two foul, quote unquote, foul trouble, he scored a bunch in the second quarter. He had 13 points at halftime on six out of seven from the field. Desmond Bain was just attacking with so much force and was moving with so much speed with the basketball. I thought it was very notable. I think he's looked really, really good this season with the speed that he's playing with and that he's not out of control. His overall stats against the Rockets, he had 17 points. He had four assists, two steals, and two blocks and two turnovers. And then against the Magic, he had 13 points, seven rebounds, two assists, two steals, and three turnovers. Now, against the Rockets, Bain had a 28-game streak of making two or more three-pointers snapped. He didn't make a three-pointer at all in that game. He had one where his toe was on the line, so that's a two-pointer. That 28-game streak with at least two or more made threes was the second longest such streak in Desmond Bain's career. He had a 30-game streak that overlapped the end of the 2022 season and the start of the 2023 season. By the way, those two streaks by Desmond are the fifth and sixth longest streaks in the NBA over the past five seasons. Steph Curry, Dante DiVincenzo, Fred Van Vliet, and James Harden have longer streaks. Now, against the Rockets, Ja Morant had 24 points, two assists, and six turnovers. So he wasn't really able to get other guys involved. A A lot of that, of course, was just the lack of teammates making shots and a lot of that you give credit to the Rockets defense like Santi Aldama only had two points he wasn't able to get looks at the basket the Rockets were tremendous defensively in that game beyond the rebounding they were really denying the Grizzlies open looks in the Rockets game Brandon Clark he only made one out of five of his field goal attempts and was used in mop-up time since he basically found himself out of the rotation like we were talking about in the second half. Now, Jake LaRavia so far, against the Rockets, he had six points, six rebounds, and four assists, plus two turnovers. He played the final 15 or 16 minutes against the Magic. They left him out there and then never took him out. Uh, He finished with three points, seven rebounds, two assists, and a steal. So far, Jake's numbers for the season, and they're not bad at all. He's not scoring a lot, but he's made 56% of his field goal attempts so far, uh, and he's averaging close to five rebounds per game, plus getting two assists per game. The weird thing is he missed free throws. He was two out of five from the foul line against the Rockets. We know he's good at getting to the foul line. It is abnormal, though, for him when he misses those shots. Now, Jalen Wells... I think overall, you'd say Jalen Wells has had a strong start to the season. He has hit some three-pointers. That's the main thing that's being asked of him. He's also done some other stuff. He's scored in some in-between areas. Now, against the Rockets, he played all of the fourth quarter garbage time and was really putting up some shots in that garbage time, and he did not make many of them, so that really destroyed His shooting line, he ended up a terrible 3-for-14 from the field against the Rockets. Against the Magic, he was just 2 out of 6 from the field, but he did make his only 3-point attempt. 
So overall, his numbers after his first three games, he is just 7 out of 26 from the field, which is a putrid 27%. He's 4 out of 11 on three-pointers. So that means he's 3 for 15 on two-pointers. Will he be the guy who loses playing time if Luke Kennard returns this week? That's going to be a question. You assume Luke Kennard is going to get in over one of either John Conchar, who missed the Rockets game with that sore foot, or over Jake LaRavia. I don't think Luke's going to take Jake's minutes. It might be a Jalen Wells situation. Will they ever shorten the rotation to 10? I mean, you would think so, but, I mean, Taylor Jenkins seems to be enjoying playing this many guys so far. Um, Finally, Yuki Kawamura. He got in the game against the Rockets and the Magic. There was a moment at the end of the game against the Magic where the crowd was chanting for him. It seemed exhilarating for the home fans in attendance. Unfortunately, Yuki does not have a highlight play yet, at least not one where he's not the one on the receiving end of the highlight. So Yuki at least got to receive that home ovation and play in front of of the home fans. And finally, I guess the last thing, I'm not sure if I said this already, I'll be honest, but I thought this was very notable. The Grizzlies played Santi Aldama at the three with Brandon Clark and Jaron Jackson Jr. Now it was very brief, but I liked the look a lot with the way Santi Aldama is shooting the basketball, you know, over 50% right now, through the first three games, and if you include preseason as well, with the way he's shooting the basketball, why not play him at the three? And I liked the look of Santi playing small forward alongside Brandon and Jaron. And by the way, here's more fun with meaningless stats. That three-man lineup combination last played together Santi Aldama's rookie year, and they only played 13 possessions that rookie year. They were only credited with playing three possessions in the game against the Magic. But let's do the tally. That's now 16 all-time possessions of Santi Aldama, Brandon Clark, and Jaron Jackson Jr. on the court at the same time. They've outscored their opponent 24-10 to 10 in that time. That's a plus 88 net rating. Fun with extremely small sample sizes. And with that, I think I hit all the notes. Although, again, I did not organize my notes very well, so it's possible I missed some things and or repeated things. Anyways, thanks for bearing with me. If you want to support this show, you can do that, by the way, at patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. If you join up over there, you get access to exclusive bonus content. Plus, you can join the Grizzlies listener Slack channel. Thank you to everyone who has joined up over there. Also, go and try out Underdog Fantasy. Remember that promo code FBBF. All right. Hope you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Go Grizz.